The following interview was conducted with uh, Wilma Jean Kay for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on November the 18th, 2007 at her residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in well, the early years. I was born on a farm in Huntington County and um, uh, I, have, uh, I, ha I had a brother and a sister and we were all very close together in ages and um, my mother had been a school teacher in a one room school for two years before she was married and my dad always laughed and said he wanted to marry her before she got to be a crotchety old school teacher. <laughs> my father came to Purdue for two years um, in the School of Agriculture. He had grown up on a farm and that was all he'd known and he thought, well, that's probably what he should do. So he came here and at the end of his sophomore year, um, he was in the uh, Army, ROTC, and their whole class of his sophomore year and others were called out for a disturbance on the Mexican border. And so they all departed in the summer and they went down to the Mexican border to try and quell this disturbance. I think it was Vila was one of the big leaders. Of, I don't know what, I don't recall now exactly what all the disturbance was about. And I don't remember exactly how many months they were there, but it was quite an experience for him because the place the encampment uh, was all cactus and they had to clean up all the cactus. As a result, he would never let us girls have a little cactus plant in the house because he said he'd seen enough cactus. Well, anyway, that was the early life and so after he came out, I came back from uh, uh, that experience, um, he decided that, he, uh, would, that they would get married, which they did. And they went back on this, went on this farm uh, in Huntington County, and uh, that's where we were born. And he had several crop failures, and he just knew that farming was not what he wanted to do. So he, because he had two years at Purdue at that time, he that qualified him to do some teaching. So he did teach some in the township school and over in Markle, a little town. And um, he did that for a while, and the summers he worked in construction and on the railroad, and he did several things over a period of several years because he knew what he really wanted to do was to go into medicine. And so ultimately, with even some summer school here and there, uh, picking up some courses and, and talking to the head of IU Medical School, um, he determined this more that this is what he was going to do. So here we were three kids and he was trying to raise three kids and my mother had some health problems so it was a pretty rocky time. But he did make it through medical school and we lived in Indianapolis for about four years while he was uh, going in residency and other parts of the program. And um, so he was uh, after he was graduated, uh, my grandfather had some office space here in Huntington. So they, after looking around several places, they decided yes, and people warning them, it wasn't a good idea to go back to your hometown, but this is what you wanted to do. And he was a very success, successful doctor here for about 50, well, almost 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I attended his graduation when I was 12 years old. So. I realized the importance of it. Sure. So, anyway, that's pretty much what happened there. And uh, then you, uh, how did you? What was high school like? You went to high school in Huntington, then. Yeah, went to high and school then, in Huntington, uh -huh. right in in the local high school. And then what? Uh, Purdue. Went, Purdue. And then I went to Purdue. Came to Purdue in 1935, and I was absolutely delighted because. And my father always spoke very fondly of Purdue. He loved Purdue. And even though he's going to IU, his loyalties were still Purdue, Purdue all the way. 
So we all grew up with the idea that, uh, that Purdue was the place. And so my dad brought me to school. My mother really didn't have the heart to come with me because she was so broken hearted to lose the first one from home. But my, so anyway, I lived and came and the only women's residence hall was Doomy. And uh, so this was a whole new world and a whole new thing for me. And, and then very shortly I real understood that Amelia Earhart was coming. And um, being 17 years old and very shy, I thought, what could I ever say to Amelia Earhart, you know? So I was very reluctant to, and we were all welcome to go and sit at the director's table at the evening meal particularly, or lunch or whatever. And somehow I could never quite get up my courage to really go and engage in conversation. But I had the privilege of observing her a lot, and um, she lived in a suite down on the first floor, and I was on the third floor, so that way I didn't see that much of her during the day. But her, and occasionally her husband would come and visit, but not too often. And, um, but anyway, I did hear her speak on a couple occasions, and I was very impressed with her. And I was very impressed because she was a different kind of a woman than I was used to seeing. I mean, she was tall and short cropped hair and a slim figure, almost boyish figure. And But she was always, seemed very cheerful and pleasant. And, and uh, I've always regretted that I just didn't have the courage, to, but it was just, that I was just too young and too shy, and she rather, I was rather in awe of her because here she was flying airplanes, and my goodness, it hadn't been long since I was, every time I'd hear an airplane fly over, I'd run out in the yard and look up and make sure that, you know, see this wonderful thing. So she impressed me a great deal. Also, during that period, Lillian Gilbert came and stayed in the, in the hall. Not as long or not as much, but she was here as a consultant on time and motion study, mostly for in the engineering, School of Engineering. Right. So she was a much older woman than Amelia. I don't know how much, but she was the one cheaper by the dozen. They had big family. And a very interesting woman, but she was older. There again, I didn't get that much acquainted because she wasn't she was not around that much, but she was definitely living there or in and out a lot. So that was kind of my experience. Unfortunately, I should have, if I would known then what I know now and been the person that I've grown in the years, I would not have hesitated to, although I would have still been a little bit shy about it, but I would have made, I would have talked to her, but Things change a lot from your 17 till you get to be my age and how you accept and how to do. But what was your major at? Uh... Well, uh, actually, this is kind of strange too, in a way. When I was in high school, there were three home economics teachers from graduate from Purdue, and one was in clothing and textiles, and one was in, uh, well, kind of a mixture. She taught some foods and some clothing. And, but the one I got the closest to was Emma Klein, who was a foods major at Purdue. And she took an interest in me because she could see I was very interested in foods work. So she brought me to Purdue and toured me along with another girl that was coming to, or two other girls that were coming to Purdue. So she had a, a very good friend, and you probably have heard of these two that were professors in institution management. One was Ruby Clark, and one was Edith Gamble. And so she brought me over to the school, and Ruby Clark was a very good friend of hers. And um, she introduced me to these two wonderful professors and ladies I later found out. Well. I felt very comfortable with, it was the institution management, which is now the 
RHIT program and it's grown now from where we were a class of 25 to well over 400, I understand. So anyway, that cinched everything. After I met them and I was already sold on Purdue, um, there was only one way to go and institution management. I have never regretted it because I thoroughly enjoyed Food's work. Um, it was, what was the campus like? Were you in, did you join any clubs when you were here? Um, well, I didn't know a thing about sororities, but after we left the residence hall, we had one year. We were allowed only one year in the hall oh. because they were trying to save it for incoming girls. And I that this residence hall was for women only. Women only. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, well, everything on campus is women only or men only for many, many years till we had the courts, which was a long time later. And excuse me, Doomy is not as big as it, it was smaller at that time. They haven't they built onto it? There's Windsor. Well, kind of... that was part of the Windsor Comet okay. complex. Okay. And then they came along. There was Sheely and Sorry. Wood, and the other. There's another hall there that came along fairly soon, but they I think. Uh, Sheely may have been under construction, or Woodhall maybe, because when my sister came to school two years later, or three years, she could get into Woodhall, and she lived in there all her schooling. But when the rule was when I was there that after your freshman year, it was necessary you move out. Well, I didn't want to move into a rooming house because I felt that was not good for me to be off campus. and. So I didn't know one thing about sororities. So there were six sororities on campus and my mother had never belonged to anything like that. And she was, of course, she went to a teacher's college for two years. And so anyway, the idea was that you came and you lived for, a, I don't know, was it like a weekend and two or three days in the Union, in Purdue Memorial Union. You moved in there, and then you went around to little teas in these six sororities. Well, I didn't know anything. I, it was okay. I enjoyed them, and the, it was a good way to get acquainted with a lot of girls. And the food was good too. Oh yeah. Well, I didn't ever. I never minded that about the tea. That I that I enjoyed. And so I, it turned out, and I didn't know this in the background, that there were two Alpha Chi's that lived in Huntington. They had graduated the year before. They had alerted this sorority here that I was coming and to notice me as I was coming through Rush. Well, I didn't know anything that, but they did quite a snow job on me. <laughs> and um, and I did like the girls, and they were very friendly and nice. And over the years, I've been very active in the alumni group. And our daughter, um, I was so happy here when she came to Purdue. Uh, she, after Rush, she joined Alpha Chi, and then I had a granddaughter that joined here about six years ago, and she's, or no, seven. She's now graduated from Purdue. So that was a gratifying experience all the way. And, uh, but that was the alternative then, and I was glad that I, sure. that this was the alternative and worked out well. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of that my experience there, and then I was active all those years, and which was great, very nice. Well, after graduate, now when did you graduate from Purdue, and then what was next? 1939. Okay. And I had the good fortune of of. Um, being hired by Purdue Memorial Union as an assistant food supervisor. And I was delighted because it's, oh, I thought that would be nice to stay on campus just a little bit longer because I, I felt good about everything and I was felt like home. And I wasn't quite ready to go out in the world and be in foods work, some strange place. It would have been okay, I guess, but Anyway, I was there for two years, and it was a good thing I stayed because during that time, I guess the, I 
went over there in the summer of 1939. And um, it was hot as blazes. And they were, the only thing that they could do any ventilation, they had the tall fans here and there. And they were re doing some remodeling in the Union. And um, so, and I, just a little side thing, during that time, I began having a rash on both legs. Oh, it was just itch like crazy. And so I went up to one weekend, or one time I saw my dad, who was a physician. I said, I don't know what's going on here, but this is just really getting to me. And um, he said, you know, and he looked at it and he said, you know what? He said, I think I just read about this in the medical journal, that they've come out with some new hosiery, and of course we all wore long hosiery at that time. And I think it was the nylon in them that some people were allergic to it, and, and the heat made it worse. Well, that was the answer. So quit wearing them, and he said, and they said the best thing to do was to get it back, to go to silk or the rayon. I did, and that cured it, but I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, this was, I didn't have a desk, and I don't know if you were familiar at all with Geneva Nugent. I recognize her name, but that uh, I've heard others well, speak of her. She... She was there for a long time. Uh, oh, I think about 40 years. Mm -hmm. And she knew foods like I, I've never known anyone, and it was her whole life. And she had grown up in Lafayette, and... Um, I learned and learned and learned many things. And um, I learned that how, how, to, how not to treat people. And she was a bit of a tyrant. And th but that was part of her being a, a keeping, she ran a food service and union about like a military. I mean, it was, and her food was excellent. And we even had, I bet many people in, in, connected with the Union have no idea over there that we had a butcher shop in the back of the kitchen. And we had a butcher who cut our own meat. And she insisted on that. How long that lasted, I don't know, because I lost track a lot with military service and babies and so forth. But anyway, um, we did have that, and, um, and of course we were, at that time, we were uh, reaming our own orange juice in the morning, and I, I was working in the kitchen. Now, I wasn't sitting at a little desk. I didn't even have a desk. There was a desk in the middle of the kitchen that the supervisors could drop their pencil or a pad off and progress to the next place, but we worked in the kitchen side by side with cooks, salad makers, bakers, everybody. And so that was a good learning experience, but some days it just about killed me because we were on our feet all day except when, when we ate, and that was quickly eating lunch and dinner or whatever. And it was not uncommon to work 16, 12, 16 hours a day, and that was just it. Sometimes straight days for whoever, whatever. But I learned a lot, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about, I was glad when garbage disposers came in, because <laughs> uh, Miss Nugent, I was telling someone this morning about this, and it occurred to me. She, the garbage cans were big, like that, that tall, and I have seen her in the salad department go down in the garbage can up to her our shoulders, feeling around to see how much they wasted in the way of lettuce and this, because food cost was a big item. And so I, that tells you a little bit that, about her. But and, and and oh, she would just sometimes bawl out the cooks in a loud voice in front of everybody as she was going through the kitchen. You could hear her. She would come in like a full sail ship and um, 
but she had order and, and our food was excellent and uh, high standards, very high standards. So I had a lot of respect for her, although uh, sometimes I felt like I wanted to shed tears when I hear her pick on some of the people. And I caught it a couple of times, really. And so I had, because I was making roll dough one time and I made a mistake as I read the recipe and we I was enlarging it or, and I had too much flour in it. I don't know how she caught when she could see everything that was going on. So she came by and she said, what is wrong with this dough? And I said, well, Miss Nugent, I inadvertently put too much flour in it. Oh, she just screamed at me and she said, we could have taken care of, oh, I had just thrown it in the, tra in the garbage can. Oh, we, we could have taken care of that. We could have added something to this and added that and this and that. Well, so, but as I say, that was one sample I caught it and why I realized, so. Uh, but anyway. Where were you living when you were working in the Union? Did you, live, get, get, you had to, were you still living in the sorority? No, oh. uh, and the apartment house is still there on University Street across from the home ec school. There's a big white apartment house. Um, as you, I come down on University Street, and of course there's left-hand side is this big white apartment house. I think it's the first or second one in. It may be the second one in. And a lot of staff at Purdue had lived there. And um, we had an apartment in the front on the second floor. Um, let's see, what, uh, well, there were four of us crammed into this small apartment. It didn't have any food service and we didn't really need it because the other three girls, two of them from Michigan State and the other girl that graduated with me, they had jobs at the residence halls in food service. And so we lived together there for two years and that was nice. Mm -hmm. So anyway, one of the good parts, the, the best part of this whole thing was um, we had been working on a some big reception or something one Sunday afternoon, and the girl, one of the girls that was brand new with me, she came from Iowa State, and her dad was um, dean of students, and we became good friends. And um, so Jane had a friend from Iowa State. She was already in, pretty much engaged to somebody else, but this was another one that had come to Purdue for graduate school in civil engineering. And so one Sunday evening, I guess Robbie said, this is the fellow from, that was Jane's friend, said, oh, I'm tired of studying. Why don't we see if we can find some girl? Who do you know that we might, Bill said, Bill, that my future. He was from brand new from University of New Hampshire and he was just getting started in civil engineering in grad school. And um, said, do you, don't you know, do you know somebody, some girls, let's, let's go out and get a Coke or do something. And it was, oh, by that time it's probably 10 o'clock because we were just cleaning up from this reception and banquet or whatever. And, and Robbie said, well, he said, I know Jane Helser. And why don't we call her and see if she knows any girl? And I know it for blind dates at all. And I was sort of semi-engaged to a fellow that had gone to Connecticut to work that had just graduated from Purdue. And so she, he said, I'll just call Jane. And so Jane asked me if I want to go out. And I was tired. And I don't think I wanted to go out any place. But I said, okay, I'll go out. And they decided they'd go to the sweet shop and have a Coke. So, and here was this strange guy from New Hampshire. Well, I knew it was all over that night. That, that was it. <laughs> so we dated, and that was two years later. Then we, that was in November of nine, uh, 1939. And so, and 
so he was a good salvation sometimes and I'd come walking home late from work way late at night after reception and everything like he was always would walk me home a lot of the time and and sometimes there were tears because I was so tired but, oh my feet would feel like boils uh, you know you're on your feet all day and you just don't realize how your feet can feel at the end of the day but anyway so that was the really good part and um, so then uh, now then the war came on so did he did he have to go into the service the war was on he, by oh this yes time. and it was things were just heating up very so good all over the world all over the world and then you were here till 41 working on uh -huh. yeah so uh anyway we were married in uh november 4th 1941 we just celebrated our 66th wedding anniversary and so, of course, Pearl Harbor was a month after we got married, and by this time, he had uh, got his de uh, uh, grad his graduate degree, as, and um, had a job in a construction company in Newport News, Virginia. So we went there, and in an apartment which is right across from. Uh, the big navy or the big uh, base there at uh, oh at uh, in well in Virginia right there where the Newport uh huh right and so we were right across from that and oh and it all the activity that was going on you'd see big aircraft carriers in there and all kinds of things going on and of course it was um, soon we were into it. And uh, so, uh, Bill had been a, he was a, he was born in Canada, however, he didn't live there very long, but he had just gotten his U.S. citizenship in June. And he, I could see he was getting restless and wanting to get in, uh, and, um, and, and they were needing officers badly. So he applied for um, a Navy duty which is what he won, and my goodness, he, I think he hadn't any more and applied, and he had a call, and with a couple of days from Chicago, we want you. Well, this was kind of a shocker, because uh, here we'd been down on this, well, on this construction job for several months, and um, in the meantime, uh, I was expecting, of course, and that added to the whole problem, and... Um, and our son was born in the following December. So finally by, um, I think it was August of that summer, he was in the Navy. And so the decision was what we were going to do because people don't realize that you just didn't go and trail your guy around into, as they were having training and they were doing all this. So my folks very graciously uh, asked, us to come home and they said uh, they my mother was very busy at that time helping my dad some in the office besides he had some other help but she he was so busy he was having office hours at night and he always made house calls and my mother really was quite busy helping him she said we're willing to have you come and we're glad to have you come but there's no way you can go out and work by that time my sister was home and her husband who was in the military, she was out teaching. and Oh, she finally worked, wound up working in a factory in Huntington. She said, but I can't take on raising a baby on top of it so you can go work. I said, that's perfectly all right. That's what I expect to do. So we were there most of three, three and a half years. And so he did have, uh, he had worked in um, uh, civil engineering just for a few months before he went into the service. So thankfully he had the opportunity to come back to Purdue and when the uh, war was over then and we could find a place to live uh, and the only reason we found a place to live was R.B. Stewart asked him if he, knowing that he could survey, if he would lay out a horseshoe shape place out in what is now Tower Acres. And 
that uh, they would like to put some little temporary homes, and they turned out to be national homes, out there. And Bill said, well, I'll be glad to do it, provided I can have one of the homes, because we don't have a place to live yet. And uh, in the meantime, he'd come back, and he was a rumor with, well, like, uh, well, the Knapps, Dean Knapp, they had taken him in graciously, and he was living there. And so we did get moved in in November of 1946, and he had been released in January, so we were lucky at that, because a lot of them were veterans returning, uh, moved into the black and whites that were over, and we had many, many friends that were living in what they called black and whites, temporary, very temporary, on State Street. And many of them were longtime staff members after that. And uh, so we lived there then for uh, about, I think, a little over three years until we built our home out in Sugar Hill. I don't want you to know where Sugar Hill is and how, but we lived there for 52 years. And that again was because of Bill's surveying ability. And R.B. Stewart had this plot of land that had belonged to the McCormicks, which was a cornfield. And he said, he called Bill and he said that he had wind that these folks were going to sell to someone that was going to put some national homes in there. And he did not want that to happen next to the university. And he also wanted to protect his property because it was right next door to us, Bill in the woods. So he asked Bill, he said, would you come in? And he told him a little bit what he wanted. And I think it turned out about 16 homes we had. And that was right off of McCormick there, just beyond Stadium. And um, so Bill went in and laid this out back toward the pasture field and around. And um, so Bill again said, I'll be glad to do this provided I can have choice of a lot. And so we did, we got back in the corner and I had the fields behind us and the woods where I could go and walk and take the children and I, well, we loved it. 52 years was great, but I, I hated to leave there, of course. And uh, Now, your husband was with the civil engineer. Did he join the faculty? Yeah, he? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, his specialty was surveying? Or? Well, he taught a, a lot of subjects there. As he finally wound up, well, materials testing, um, hydraulics, when they needed someone in the beginning, they would plug him in to do all this. And so he um, taught several things. Then the thing, he was chosen to be co-op coordinator for the School of Civil Engineering, and that was his great favorite. And he was that for about 20 years. And he loved to, um, they were outstanding students, and they would go and work away from Purdue with various uh, industries. And uh, he was very much involved in placing students uh, with different industries and getting acquainted with the industries and getting very well acquainted with students. And he had some very outstanding students that he still hears, hear, does hear from. That's wonderful. And now, uh, now, did you work, you were with the university as well? Um, when I did not go back to work um, until the children were in school, both of them. Our, our son was five years older, of course. We, Laurie was born in 1948 after Bill came back, of course. And so I did not want to go to work until they were in, both in school. And so he, uh, Laurie was six, and we had a neighbor that worked in the residence hall. Um, and so one evening, we were having a social evening, and I told, I, I, somehow offhandedly, I said, um, sometime I think I'd like to work in the residence hall. And he sat back up on his chair and he said, are you serious? <laughs> I said, well, yes, but I don't want to work full time yet. Um, so I did come in and work half time 
and I decided I really, really liked it. And then um, they had a special procedure in planning menus with some charts. And so, um, in time, they assigned me to planning menus. And I did plan the menus for the halls with, using charts and meetings and so forth for over 15 years. And How many residence halls were there? There weren't as many as now, were there? Or no, and I was fortunate. This was another thing about I was very fortunate at the time I worked because um, when I came in the residence halls, and that was in, uh, well, let's see, I started in, I guess, 1954. I have to think back how old Laurie was. And, That's um, a good perspective. When you put your children in, you can slot it in a little yeah, easier. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, um, there was the only hall then was the Windsor Complex, or part of it, and Meredith Hall. Meredith was all there was at, at that time, and Carey Hall, of course, the men's hall. Sure. So I was fortunate that during that time, my working for 26 years, I saw nine halls, brand new, come online. And then they had one of the latter ones, they were still needing housing for students because, see, it had gone from 6,500 students when I was in school to a huge influx kept coming and coming after World War II, and they kept needing housing and more housing and more housing. And so we, I saw, um, well, there was, you know, it started with Owen and, uh, Owen and, um, uh, well, we called them one, H1, two, three, four, five, and, that, and Owen and Tarkington and Wiley, and then um, we got into Earhart and then Harrison, and, you know, till we had nine, then the courts. And so here was an experiment that they had not tried yet in the residence halls. And here they were building these courts, and uh, they were adjacent. Fowler Courts was where I was assigned finally. Um, it was right next door to the old poultry building, and so they turned that into uh, some housing there too. So we had, that was quite an experience because it was decided that the three, the, it would be for about 650 students, and they would put maybe about 50 in the upper floor of, of our house. And um, there would be the first three courts would be women, and the last three courts would be men. Never had Purdue housed any men or women near each other in the residence halls. Well, some of the natives, the locals, and some of the parents, and just a lot of people were very distressed and concerned putting men and women students that close together. And so, it was great. We had a wonderful social program, and many were married, and it, and it lasted. And I still hear from some of them with the, even well, that have children, and now some that are married and have grandchildren. So, um, but anyway, it was wonderful. And I had uh, a waiter staff that was composed of both, both men and women, and um, and I'd have between our night maintenance crew of students and then we'd have not between 90 and 100 that worked according to their schedules in the kitchen and various cooking or frying or counter or whatever. And um, it was a great experience. And so we were the first to do that. So that's kind of neat. It worked great. Were those the day, days when it was still ser it was served, or was it uh, cafeteria style? Yeah, it was cafeteria by that okay. time, mm -hmm. and um, we had to well, we had to go into cafeteria because first of all, we couldn't build the dining rooms large enough to hold the number of residents to feed that many, so we had to rotate through cafeteria. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. So we had two serving lines as most of the new halls did to start with. And um, 
So that was when we really got into the uh, cafeteria service, mm -hmm. which were fine. We had awfully long lines sometimes at Fowler with the numbers we were serving. And, and something that's kind of cute, um, when we first moved there, you know, students, have, uh, they have been thinking the funniest things. Because Fowler House had been the old poultry building, for a while they called it Cackleberry Inn. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of a fun name. A little name on there. Yeah. yeah it took us a, quite a while to outlive the Cackleberry Inn, but anyway, it finally disappeared. But. Yeah. So I saw a lot of changes in food service there uh, from when from the time I started. Um, you know, we were having fish delivered in ice barrels on the dock, and we were getting um, beef that uh, in pieces that the cooks had to portion. You know, now all this comes in all portioned, breaded, whatever. Same beef and pork and anything we were serving, no frozen food yet, and and now they get in all this frozen food, even and the potatoes that are all peeled and bagged, and we finally had a, a machine that would kind of I don't know it's almost like it had a sanding operation. You put a whole bunch of potatoes in there with water, and they would be tossed around and come out and, well, the peeling was pretty well off, but they still had eyes, and so they'd be dumped in a great big deep sink, and I had some, a woman that would be taking eyes out of potatoes most of the day, and then putting them in ice water and wheeling them in a big can into the cooler for overnight's use. And But now they get in all the powdered baked potatoes, they sure tasted different, though. The fresh, there's no difference between mashed potatoes. May, there's a great difference between mashed potatoes made with fresh potatoes than these powdered things. They are improving, but not there yet. Right, yeah. So, so you were, you were, you were it was down. a huge job uh, of uh, preparation. Um, and so now all these, oh, and we were baking all our pies and cookies and cakes from scratch. And even the pastry we did. And a wonderful woman baker that loyally drove from Attica and all kinds of weather there to come and bake. And, and the students loved her because the waiters had come in hungry to work at lunch. And, she always happened to have broken cookies. And I just turned my back and let them eat broken cookies. And I imagine she broke a few. But <laughs> so you have to be a little resilient in this right. type of work uh, when you're working with students. And yeah. Had a great group, a great time. How has the campus changed? There's a lot more. When you were here as a student, there were not very many women on campus, were there? Oh, no, oh. no, no. And, and not very many at all. I don't know. Um, let me see, what was the ratio then? Um, hmm. I, one time I knew about what it was, but I think it was about 12 to 16 to one. And so it was a long time before, you know, we got that ratio changed. And, and um, but anyway, uh, the campus, as far as the students are concerned, it, I see so much, I mean, I do see a lot of difference because the women in my class, they all wore skirts and dresses, and of course, at that, that, that time, saddle shoes and bobby socks were popular, and that's what, what we wore. And uh, the men wore nice-looking slacks or well, sweaters, or that type of thing to class, and they all look well groomed. And and uh, another change I see, and it really bothered bothers my husband. Um, the staff, the men, all wore coat and tie to class, and now he goes over to this, anywhere on campus, and he sees them from jeans to 
looked like they'd just come off the working in a barn someplace, and this disturbs him a great deal because he feels that they should be setting an example uh, for the students that are going out in the business world, and so that's just a whole other story. And, and then, um, so that's different. I see a big difference in the behavior of students. Um, I never heard of a party. And now partying and drinking has become a big thing, and this is very disturbing to me. And um, we had such a good time. Uh, I was in the era of the big bands. I think I, were, I think I was on campus at the most beautiful time anyone could be, because we had any band that was anybody that came here from, uh, you know, all the Dorseys and everybody that was any good, Paul Whiteman, you name it. We had the big extravaganzas of dances where we had sophomore cotillion and they actually lined up with their swords like this at the doorway and we all, it was a formal affair. The beautiful formals, long dresses of all kinds and corsages and it was, so we had sophomore cotillion, we had the military ball, we had the junior prom, we had, and every Saturday night a mixer. I, had, I don't know, I had more, most Saturday nights, uh, or a lot of Saturday nights, we would either go to the mixer and dance and the ballroom would be crowded and movies were popular. So all we did was, for recreation would be dancing or going to a movie. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. Yeah. Never went, never in all the time I was in Purdue was I ever invited to go out drinking. Never dated a guy that did. Um, there was only one booze joint on West Lafayette and that was the chocolate shop, I think it was just Starling. And if the men wanted to drink, There'd be a group of them get together, and they'd walk across the levee, and they'd go over town and drink. It was not respectable for women to accompany them, or even go to a bar. I'm, there were some, I think, did, with a guy, but it really wasn't respectable to go for a woman to go to a bar, and too bad it changed. And um, but anyway, I'd never heard of partying out in the apartment, rooming houses and this kind of thing, never heard of anything like that. And of course, Triple X was the only fast food, I think the only fast food for anywhere around, I don't know. And they delivered at night if you were studying, and I don't know how late they ran anymore, but they would deliver to sororities, fraternities, or whoever if they wanted something later. I don't know how late they operated, but I know they did this. and. Uh, so, and the levee has changed, hasn't it? Oh my, the levee was a burning dump. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean bad, bad, bad when I came, and was that way for years. Um, you put your trash there? Well, trash was hauled in in trucks, mm -hmm. and a big dump right there along the river. And that would be burning night and day, and, and not a very good smell down around there. It's about where, you know, they finally put in Sears, Sears. and, um, but oh, that went on for years that we had that. Down on the levee, other than that, we had uh, Ruger's Bakery, and um, I think there was another bakery that came in, and, and of course, on the hill there, where Chauncey, uh, all that now is now, that was just a big weed patch for years and years and years. The only thing in it that was looked good was holly, some wild hollyhocks. And, and of course, in the village itself, there was just the post office. There was a post office for everybody, and, and a couple of bookstores, uh, Deep Reisner's, and of course, Southworth's, and that was, and then the University Bookstore, I think, finally came in on the corner. And the bank was there, and a couple of drug stores, and we had a little grocery store in there for a while. So naturally that 
changed a lot, and we had two churches, the Methodist and the Federated, and the library, and that was just about it. Mm. And uh, certainly has changed. Yeah. yeah. And one other big change was that no cars were permitted by students on campus. And you had to have a very spatial permit that either you have sick parents, or people, you were needed at home, or you lived on a farm and you were needed at harvest time or planting time. Um, you had to have a really a guilt edge reason why you needed a car or a work situation around here or off that you needed a car to get to. So we had very, very few cars. Mm -hmm. And street cars were the mode of, mode of getting around. And uh, so even if we wanted to go to the basketball game, uh, when I was in school, um, Lambert wasn't built yet or finished. And um, so we'd have to ride this um, streetcar to go over to Jeff High School to watch the game. The Purdue played there. Yeah, that's what they did there at that time. And uh, so this was kind of a fun time, riding with a group of students over to the game and back. And, and then I, one kind of funny thing that happened, just as regular as clockwork on the week, be coming back on the streetcar, and I think they chose the conductor very well for these occasions, because he wouldn't lose his temper and throw a fit. But before we'd get us up the hill, as far as Triple X, or maybe way back before that, a certain number of students uh, would, there's of course the men's students would get up, and they would unscrew every light bulb, every light bulb in that streetcar and by the time we'd get up the hill onto the campus it was black just black and the conductor would just keep going and going and going and we'd get down to where the turnaround was down at Cary Hall and so we all hopped off and it was dark as could be then you had to turn the streetcar around to head back and some of these great big students they actually could turn Work helped turn this streetcar around to head it back. So it was it was a, not only the ball game, but there was but a lot, of, the, so a lot of excitement otherwise. So that's just one of the funny things that happened. <laughs> uh, uh, do you have a um, uh, any special tradition, a campus tradition that kind of sticks in your mind that you sort of liked? Uh, well, one of the things that was done, I think, was a was a lot of fun. Um, we had senior chords, and it started with the fellows having the yellow chords, and they would ride all over them and different things, and um, what school they were in, and and sometimes they were really quite funny, or they'd have a, something from a comic strip or something of that nature, and then the girls would they started uh, yellow corduroy skirts. And they would have right all over that. Well, then one of the other things that went along or along with this was, oh, they had the uh, derbies at that time, and so the um, first football game, or you would wear these, and the first touchdown, all these the fellows with the derbies, all the hats would go in the air, and it was really, really really a fun thing. Yeah. But the other sidelight on that was that the seniors had to be very careful in hiding these beforehand because the freshman and the underclass one would steal them. And so a lot of them went under mattresses and I don't know where all they went, but the places that they put them were really something. Uh, and to preserve them till the day of the game. Sure. And then the other thing I liked so much, and it's I know it was a lot of work, but it still was a fun thing. Um, the fraternities and the sororities and uh, co-ops and different organizations would make these beautiful decorations for football occasions. And about, and usually they'd have something to say, and sometimes not too good, about the other school and what Purdue was gonna do to them 
but they were very, very clever, very creative signs. And uh, people came from miles around, drive around, all around, all over campus to see these un unusual, creative displays. And, and I don't know, they, I think they've tried a time or two to get this going again, but I don't think with much success. You know, television and computers, and all these things killed off a lot of the creative, the fun things like this, where, and that it made good friends, bonded the students when they were having a big project like that going. And, uh, and of course, uh, I think that race that they have in the spring is a good thing. The Grand Prix. Grand Prix, right. yes. And I saw some of that. One sidelight, I would have to tell you, this is, uh, uh, one of our students was working on a, a car for the Grand Prix. And we had, I had a manager that time, the, the hall manager was Bob Cadwell. And he was, a, he was a good one. And he knew what was going on all the time, it seemed like. And so this student came up on the dock and he was working on this car and he worked all night on it, getting ready. And so I, my window of my office was, I could look out right on the dock. And so Bob Cadwell came along to this fellow and he said, he got engaged him in conversation about his car and what he was doing with it and all of that. Bob kept looking at all over and everything. It turned out it was a Purdue lawnmower, a golf <laughs> course lawnmower. He was modifying it with the motor to, for his car. And so uh, <laughs> Bob said, well, I think we better look into this and take it back where it belongs. Well, of course, the guy was he's caught red-handed, but the whole thing. So that ruined his car, did not participate. <laughs> so that was one of the cute yeah, things, right. sidelight yeah. on that. Do you have a favorite memory of Purdue that you'd like to share with us? Any favorite memory? Well. Or just some general summary comments? I think one, well, I have a couple of memories that I think are showing. And you may remember in front of Fowler How, and Fowler, the old hall, and I don't know what that tree was, but it was a huge spreading tree. And in it, it was very large. And I just about broke my heart when they cut it down. But under that tree, the students would gather with their books and they'd study and there'd be in the lawn under that tree would be covered with students that would be studying. And that, I was thinking about that the other night. That's one thing about this interview that made me start thinking of all the good memories. That was one I think of. The other memory I think of, of course, one of the, as far as Purdue is concerned, and, and uh, I was so sorry when they tore down Hevelin Hall that, another thing, it just about broke my heart. And I, R.B. Stewart, well, progress, supposedly. 